We're going to talk more Olympics here on Highlands and joining us is the Athletics Ireland Olympic team manager, Teresa McDade. Teresa, good to see you. You're welcome on to Highland once again. Thank you very much. It's kind of, it's kind of become just all, all of a sudden very real there, actually, as you just said. Yeah. That. It's kind of, kind of, oh, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's very real indeed from where it was this time last year because um, I was doing just looking back and a press release came out in February from Kieran O'Donnell. Um, saying that you were blessed and privileged to to be in the position that you were as uh, the the team manager of Ireland, and it was less than 150 days back then to the Olympics. And um, Tracy, you've had to wait a lot more than 150 days with the pandemic. Yeah, it has been a bit of a, and a lesson from from my perspective. Of course, it's it's a massive and it still remains a privilege and an honour. But my God, really, you have to appreciate what it must have been like for athletes. And for athletes to have kept going and to have continued to stay motivated and to stay trained and to and to train, particularly for technical events and and without facilities and everything else. So, whatever about me hanging on in there, I think fair due to all the athletes. And by God, have they really come out and and showed their metal and and had some performances to get their get themselves on that team. Yeah, you've been hanging on, as you say. Were you worried at any stage that the games this year could be cancelled again? I think it always could have been. I think it was always a concern. Um, but I, I think just that because there was so much involved that it was it was always likely to go ahead. And certainly, you know, from an organisational point of view, and I suppose I came on, my role from as team manager was extended in January to include um, more logistics and that side of thing. Um, so from that point of view, I would have been a lot more involved earlier than normal. But, and it was never never really an indication at any stage that we weren't going or it wasn't going ahead. I was always very clear that it, it was more than likely to go ahead than not. And I think it was more just maybe um, speculation in the media and the general public and particularly within Japan itself. Yeah, but, well, there's still that concern about it, Tracy, because we see this week that they're, uh, they're suggesting now that, that there won't be the 10,000 allowed into the, to the opening ceremony. There's only going to be VIPs only, but we sort of have to watch this race or watch this space rather as uh, as it goes along because some of these events could be affected spectator-wise in particular. Oh, I'm without a doubt. And listen, let me tell you, the protocol um, that we have to go through is unbelievably strict. Uh, we literally will be, you know, we're, we're going into um, a holding camp, a training camp, if you like, um, in Fukuroi. And basically, we're very fortunate that we have a hotel that has grounds um, because literally we're going from uh, the hotel to uh, the tra- a bus to the track and back, and that'll be that'll be basically the length of it. So, you know, the measures in which that the Japanese community are being protected in there is is massive. But um, I suppose this is something that we have to do uh, to partake in the games and to allow our athletes to partake. So, you know, we just have to accept it and do it to the best we can, and not to the best. We just have to do it absolutely, and you know, and I think it'll be a very very different. Olympic Games um, for a lot of people that have been there before and I suppose for maybe some athletes as for the first time I suppose they don't know maybe any different but um, I do think it's, it's it will have a very different feel to it and but I think too I suppose I've, I've traveled to a couple of different competitions this year and particularly uh, the second last one that I was at was the World Relays and to be fair it was really really well organized and you know the protocols all worked and all we all came home um, safely and and COVID free. So I suppose that gives you some confidence. But without a doubt, it's it's a very different approach. Yeah. What about your role then? You, you touched on it briefly there at the start about having to do a lot more sort of admin and, and, and logistics. So how has the Olympic team manager role evolved over the last couple of years? And and what has your duty over the last twelve months been? And what what is it going to be now as we head under the games, Teresa? Well, as I say, it has developed uh, more this year because our um, our operations, our high performance operations person uh, moved on in January. So I, you know, for, for the uh, Tokyo um, Games, I have taken on that kind of role. So I've been the key point of contact uh, with, um, on behalf of Athletics Ireland, along with the high performance uh, director Paul McNamara. So it has been um, a great introduction to a lot of people that I've often heard about um, with the um, the OFA, and I suppose really it's been that um, for the la- for the first couple of months it was very much a lot of meetings and decisions and being involved in 
planning, um, but um, it has certainly ramped up massively in the last um, two months. Um, so my my um, for someone that had had a very uh, quiet COVID, it has just gone from one extreme to the other extreme. So a lot of it men, a lot of chasing up with athletes, a lot of um, just liaising with the Olympic Council in terms of the, the OFA, in terms of just logistics really. And, and even say, for example, of how uh, I suppose it's maybe a good example to give in relation to what it's going to be like in Japan and the level of admin that's involved in this particular games is a few weeks ago there I had to prepare um, what was called a journey plan and I basically had to identify what everyone that was on the team likely had the remotest chance of being on the team and I basically had to plan out what they were going to be doing hour by hour from morning you know for the whole period of time that they would be there so um, that's that's the, that's is the the level of precision, if you like, and planning that's involved. Yeah, and I suppose one thing about being a manager is it's, it's what's key to your role as well is having the right sort of team around you because you you rely heavily on them. So you do, uh, uh, Teresa, and uh, obviously when you're at a competition at the level that the Olympics have, they're going to play key roles for you as well. Yeah, and uh, we have um, a new um, the new you know the replacement from the, the high performance operations person, a guy called Davy Stevenson. Has come on board and in the last couple of weeks now he's come on board as well to help with a lot of the logistics and the admin as well too which is great and i suppose really like a lot of olympic games you have the trial run in the world championships the year before where you had the likes of the high performance director paul mcnamara and the head physio paul carraher and myself and his team manager so i suppose we've had a you know we've had a dry run through doha in terms of how we will work together as a team uh, and then again it's you know we have you know, we're part, I suppose, of the bigger family of the OFA in terms that we have, um, you know, they have a massive um, team around them as well, too. So we're, along with all the other sports, you know, are under their umbrella and we're all, I suppose, one one big community there. Yeah. Uh, I know that uh, you're very, very proud of it and, and you see it as a huge honour. You're the first uh, lady to hold the position of, of Olympic team manager, Teresa. I am. And I am smiling there because I have to correct you. I'm the first woman. Uh, Oshin is the postal lady. Okay. <laughs> uh, just to be politically correct. Yeah. So, yeah, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, anyway, I'm certainly the first woman um, to have held this role for Athletics Ireland. So, yeah, and listen, again, particularly in the year that was in it, maybe, um, you know, or last year, um, you know, it was very much a year for women in sport. So it was massive for... Um, you know, there's been so many examples of, of leadership in women and it was, so I'm delighted to be heading that up. And um, I think it was two, was it the year before that I got um, European Athletics um, give me a lovely award too, again, too, in terms of uh, women in sports leadership. So it's nice to be following all that. And, and again, I think I did a little bit of mentoring too. Um, the Donegal Sports Partnership have ran a really very successful uh, programme last year uh, while encouraging women to be involved in sport and, and sports management. So um, I was asked to come along and have um, a chat there and sort of share some of my experiences. So it's actually, you know, it's just great listen to sort of hopefully that you're setting that path and for loads of people to follow. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the athletes then. Um, obviously finals and if the opportunity arises, medals uh, for, for Donegal, for, sorry, Irish competitors, Teresa? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, I suppose we've probably, I think we've, again, I think we have our, maybe our largest team ever, or certainly, you know, um, um, a fair size team. And anyway, without a doubt, we have 24 um, athletes. Um, I think, and again, for a lot of people, um, it will be the opportunity to have made the games, first of all. And, and, and again, I can't help but um, reach out to the likes of Anne Marie McGlynn, who missed. The marathon which is 26 miles by four seconds like so you see how much it means for somebody not to have actually to have got there and what it means to actually even be on that team and that opportunity to actually be on that stage but in terms of that like again um we're always looking for a systemic um kind of result that we're looking for people that will perform to the best that they can you know that they will at least repeat what they've done to get there and possibly and hopefully to do better uh, we'll be looking at um, key people to make um, semi-finals, the likes of Sarah Lavin um, in the 100 um, hurdles, the likes of Mark English in the 800 metres, um, the likes of Sarah 
Healy and the 1500 meters are all pretty well ranked at the moment. Then in terms of our finalists then, and um, you know, as you talk the medal hopes, you know, we, and, and I'm sure a lot of people maybe have has been following the Horizon program and Tom Barr spoke about it himself, um, you know, fourth in the last Olympics, you know, you have to say, well, that's, he, he's obviously looking to do one better. Um, Kira McGeehan, who we all know and love since she was a young girl, um, has been a finalist, a world finalist and top 10 in the world championships in Doha. So again, you know, you'd be you'd be certainly looking that she would be making that final again. And as the saying goes, anything can happen in a final. Um, our four by four mixed relay team as well too. You know, as um, you know, they've they've done really well. They they went recently to world relays and gained themselves an automatic qualification by being in that final, and uh, which was top eight. And then their time certainly that they ran to make that qualification would have ranked them in the top five, if I'm not mistaken, for, say, World Championships in Doha. So, um, yeah, so it'll be, um, you know, there'll be plenty, it will be busy, and then hopefully, you know, again, what you're always looking for is you're looking for athletes to progress and come through the round and to sort of kind of take it step by step. Yep. Another next mark, uh, I'm missing the 800. The 800 has come on a lot over the last uh, number of years in a particular time. Uh, he'll probably have to run his best ever. Will it to, to make a final if it, if it does to come off for him, will it? Uh, and, and certainly, you know, I think that the biggest thing there will be surviving the rounds. And eight, eight hundreds is, 800 metres is tough full stop. And 800 metres is quite tough in the championships because you have three races within in the Olympic Games within four days. So, um, and I'm sure, like Mark, I'm sure will be taking that and he'll be taking it one round at a time to get through to the semi and then the semi from to the final. Um, and Jen, you're absolutely right. Um the uh, 800 meters has moved on massively in the last couple of years and particularly coming out of lockdown and even i think we were all blown away by a lot of performances um in the indoors and particularly 800 meters um even you know guys were running 143 indoors um but uh, but from mark's point of view i suppose what's really um encouraging is that he is really coming into form he's had um several races that are of a really good quality in the last couple of weeks and then to come and uh, might have been the 11th hour for qualification, but uh, he certainly did it in style by, by running a, a new Irish record. So, um, you know, from Mark's point of view, you're hoping that he'll come into, um, you know, that, that he'll come into his own. He's coming into that form at the right time. Yep. And equally, as again, to can't forget about Brendan Boyce. Like Brendan Boyce's performance in Doha certainly would also be indicating that, you know, if he repeats that performance in Doha and manages himself and particularly with the conditions around Doha then um, you know that that will be an interesting place to watch as well. I spoke to Brendan uh, a number of weeks ago before he headed out to, to the uh, Nevada, Sierra Nevada in Spain for his training camp, high altitude, living in a cave, all that sort of thing that, that, that he does to, to get himself right. He said he would be disappointed if he was outside, outside the top eight. Is that top eight very much achievable for him? Well I think certainly based on Doha very much so. Um, and uh, I'm very glad to hear that he was in a cave because maybe that's why I had to chase him for some of his paperwork then. So <laughs> that's a good excuse. But no, I think, and I think too, what was what was really um, stood out to me in Doha was for Brennan and for obviously his coach Rob was how they prepared and how they adapted and dealt with the conditions and took on all the advice and all the experience that was given. And that certainly was... Um, a, a, a big contribution to his performance in Doha. So I have no doubt that they will do the same again and, and will come into the games very well prepared. Yeah. Uh, we'll mention a young County Tyrone girl, Eilish Flanagan. Uh, speaking of the 11th hour, she done enough to, to get a, a secure a, a, a ranking place and, and is heading to, to the games as well. But what an experience this is going to be for this young girl from Gorchin outside Oma. Yeah, and it's, it's very hard to talk about Eilish without, without talking about Roshi, her twin sister. Yeah. And they're, they're two amazing young girls now. They're fantastic. And they have been around European, they've, so their success in European Cross was very evident last year, which was great. And and I think very from very early on, you know, even 2019, um, it was, Eilish was very much earmarked to be making that kind of qualification within the steeplechase. And you're absolutely right around that even, not even experience, but... You know, for the, for the kids that are in college in America, in terms of the whole ranking and the point system, they were probably a little disadvantaged. So for her to come out and have ran 
the, you know, the races that she's had when she's come home and got the points and got the times that she needed to get there is, is absolutely fantastic, guys. So it's uh, absolutely now, and I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted for her. Yeah. Teresa, as team manager, what are you most looking forward to? Coming home. <laughs> 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 um i um i've not just for me well i suppose really from a from a team perspective that you know you're just you're 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 so focused on everything and you're planning so much ahead and you're always looking to be ready for the next step and i suppose i am a self-confessed control freak so you know once i'm organized then i'm ready to deal with whatever you can deal with and that you can solve that problem as a goal. So in case of, you know, what you're doing is to facilitate as much as you can to make sure that athletes can have that best performance or if you have to fight their corner like I've had to do in the past, then that you'll do that sort of thing. Like, so just um, really that athletes uh, perform and are happy with their performance and can perform on that big stage. And then there's certainly, you know, I would be, I would, I would be dishonest if I said that I wasn't, um, concerned about athletes' welfare and how you know that they all will stay safe and that they'll come home um, safe as well too. And then for my own, to be honest with you, I, I just don't think. I think that'll probably hit me sometime maybe in in September, October that I've actually been there. I think when you're so involved in what you're doing and you're so focused on doing your job and doing it really well, and you're right in that moment that you don't get a, get an opportunity to sort of. Um, look back and see what you've got out of it for yourself, if that makes sense. Will you get an opportunity to take in some of the rest of the, the games when, when you're there? Or are you going to be very much focused on going from hotel to track? And you might maybe, yeah. maybe be able to experience it uh, if it was a more than what it was if it was a non-COVID environment? No, and I think that's the, I think that's the thing that, that saddens me most, actually, and more so for athletes. I think athletes are not going to get that multicultural, multi-sport event that the Olympics is. Um, so, um, you know, I think I'm more sad for them than myself, I suppose. And, um, and I suppose I also think that I really would hope that I'm too busy to be able to go and see other sports because it means that our own, our own athletes are doing really, really well and they're progressing and that you're going to the track and doing that every day with them. But, but again, and especially because they're, you know, of the other Donegal connections, um, you know, you'd be loving to get out and sort of kind of um, cheering on the, the other Donegal interests that are there as well too. But um, from that perspective, I think because of the situation with COVID, it is unlikely. But as well as that, I'm really hoping that it's because I'll be too busy with the athletes are doing so well that I won't have time to go anywhere else. Yeah, well, listen, I hope you're busy. Uh, have a wonderful Olympics. Uh, hopefully it's a successful one for Ireland and uh, a very, very safe one as well. So uh, take care, Trace, and the best of luck with it. Thanks a million, Oshin.